All right. Hello, everybody. It's seven o'clock UK time. Maybe other times in other places, wherever you are, whenever you are. But hello and welcome to Hayes Reviews. This is another live stream. Uh, this is going to be part one of The Romance of the Rothschilds by Ignatius Bala. Um, this is a 1913 book. Uh, it's uh, 110 years old. How about that? And I happened to uh, find a beaten up, messed up copy uh, and uh, online for fairly cheap. And, uh, and I thought it would be a good one to read and read into the record. And so that's what we're going to be doing tonight. We're probably going to read through the first chapter uh, and we're going to see what interesting things we can discover. Hi, everybody. Hello. If you're out there watching live. Really, really wonderful to have you here. Uh, if you're not watching live, no problem. It's still wonderful to have you here. If you're watching it live and then re-watching it again at some point in the future, then double wonderful. But uh, either or, anyway, it's really good to have you here. I'm Nick of Hayes Reviews, uh, and I'm just um, a book enthusiast, and I'm trying to share that enthusiasm with other people to help people see and realize and learn and know that uh, books are probably, at this time in history, even though we have the internet and that's all well and good, still probably the best source of information um, because they are physical. You can store them and they cannot be edited in real time by evil people who work for the Ministry of Truth. So today on this live stream, we're going to be reading through. This will be the first video, video one of uh, our read through of the romance of the Rothschilds. And so I think uh, we might just get through the first chapter today. Uh, but if you're watching live, let me know if you can hear me okay. Thumbs up, maybe chat in the comment, whatever, all that good stuff. You know what to do. Um, and as we, and, and my plan for this is that I'll, I'll just read through the first chapter straight up with no commentary and no pauses. Uh, and then if anything pops up for you, if you've got a comment or a question or, or something you want to say, stick it in the comments or in the chat. And then uh, I'll review that at the end of the reading and we can, we can take a look and see what people are thinking about what we're going to learn in the romance of the Rothschilds. So take a look at this. What a, what a lovely thing we have here. So this is the romance of the Rothschilds and this is Ignatius Bala. Now I can't find anything about this writer online anywhere else. I've typed the name in uh, and nothing, nothing seems to come up. I didn't spend a lot of time looking, but a very cursory sort of initial glance uh, to find what else they might have done. Uh, I couldn't find anything. So I think Ignatius is a man and you know, 110 years ago, chances are it was a man writing this. But we can see on the front here, we have this uh, nice little crest, which is a red shield, which of course is where Roth shield, Rothschild, red shield, that's where the name comes from, right? So take a look at this. What an old beaten up battered book this is. It's still got a, it's got a, it used to be in a library. So it's got stickers to code it, to say where it is. It's even got some sort of chalk writing added to it maybe from a, the library it was in before this. If we have a look inside, uh, ooh, that's a bit overexposed, isn't it? One second, let me adjust that. We can see the, uh, yeah, it's Ab Arbo Arbroath Public Library. And uh, on the inside page here, we can see it was checked out not that many times. So not many people uh, in this particular area, I guess maybe Scotland, Arbroath, Angus, it says Angus libraries up here, and that's, that's definitely Scotland, right? Not many people taking an interest, uh, 48, 49, 1950, and 1963. So it's, it's despite how it looks, uh, it doesn't seem to have been very well read, at least not while it was part of the Arbroath Public Library collection. But a few details that are nice to point out here on the top, as you can see, the, uh, the top of the, the leaves here have, have this kind of shimmering gold finish to them, which I thought is a nice touch. Uh, but you can tell, uh, you can see at this side, I might be able to put that into uh, focus for you. That uh, is really battered. It is so battered and all the uh, ends of the um, pages are kind of out of whack, which makes it really difficult to turn the pages and turn the corners. But I think that's why I managed to get it for so cheap because it's in such poor condition. <laughs> all right, so let's get right into it. This is the Romanth Romanth, I keep doing that. Uh, when I was when I was practicing and warming up for this video, I kept talking with a lisp, <laughs> so I'm going to try and avoid that. The romance of the Rothschilds. Now, uh, one of the things that I really liked about this book, right in here on the first page, we've got uh, a little, little little illustration here of Nathan Rothschild, and with my uh, handy dandy uh, 
viewer funded webcam, book cam. I can zoom in and get you a little bit of a better view on that. Now, it is not an understatement to say, and I think you will agree, that this man truly has a face like a slapped ass. I don't know what the equivalent saying is for, for other places in other countries. Oh, it's not even coming through. Ah, oh, that's sad, isn't it? Maybe if I zoom out a little bit. I'm still getting I'm still getting the hang of this thing. Oh, there we go. That's that's made it look a bit better. So this man really does, at least in this illustration of him. I don't know how accurate it is. Let's see if I can get that close up to you there, but look at that. Drooping slapped arse face. So that's Nathan Rothschild. He is going to be uh, figuring quite uh, prominently, I would think, in the story. Uh, he's the founder of the English house of Rothschild. Uh, so he was one of the sons of, I, I think, of Maya Rothschild, who was sent out to establish a central bank. And he was sent out to England, and he established a central bank here in London. So let's have a look. Page one, well, not even page one, just the title page. We've got the romance of the Rothschilds. By Ignatius Bala, London, 1913. 1913. So I love, I love, uh, this is what I like to refer to as an SOB, which is a stinky old book because it's got that musty kind of humid, it's been in, on a shelf in a library in a basement, ignored for a long time, kind of, kind of smell and feel to it. But great. I mean, at this point, these kind of books, these kind of artifacts, they're like, um, to me, they're priceless. It's, it, it blows my mind that you can still buy these online for, you know, a few pen, pounds, a few dollars, <laughs> incredible. But these are these are becoming, uh, I think, more like antiques, more like priceless and precious artifacts from a, a pre-internet age. Anyway, that's enough preamble. So in this book, we got uh, just seven chapters. It's 266 pages. And so I'm kind of feeling like we might do seven videos where we just read one chapter per video and have a look at the comments and see if anybody has any thoughts or uh, anything they want to point out or question or refer to. Um, but, you know, it, it's quite, even though it's quite a hefty book, you'll see that there's not a lot of text on each of the pages. And it's like that all the way through. So compared to the um, H.G. Wells book that we read, which had tiny writing <laughs> and, and each page was packed, uh, I think we'll get through these chapters at a relatively decent pace. So, let's get into it. This is The Romance of the Rothschilds. Chapter 1, The Rise of the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds, who have held in their hands for more than a century the threads of the financial life of the old world, were described by Hein many decades ago as the first bankers in Europe. Even today, there is not one of the more recent financial dynasties that can boast a wealth equal to that of the famous Jewish financiers. The mere mention of their name suggests the power of millions, and, to those who are ever ready to pay homage to wealth, these descendants of a petty hawker of the Frankfurt ghetto seem to be the very personification of earthly riches." The fabulous success of the Rothschilds seems the more remarkable when we learn that the immediate founder of this powerful dynasty, the aged Meyer Amschel, was, little over a hundred years ago, a small trader in the Jewish quarter of Frankfurt and cannot have had even a dream of the millions which his family afterwards amassed. He began his career as a modest shopkeeper. His sons became millionaires, his grandsons multi-millionaires. Three generations sufficed to convert this obscure ghetto family into the greatest financial power in the world. That fact is enough of itself to invest the origin of the Rothschild firm with the significance of an historical event. Nor is the interest lessened when we realize the profound influence it has had on the fate of Europe and the whole political and social life of the West. But the conscientious historian who would relate the almost legendary course of their story, will find it useless to explore the dusty archives of states and finger the mouldering parchments of heraldic offices in search of earlier traces of the family. There are no documents carrying back the story of the Rothschilds to the Middle Ages. 
No ancestor of theirs ever sought the laurels of war on the battlefield, and certainly it is related of none that he joined a crusade to rescue the Holy Land from the heathen. We do not find the name of a Rothschild in the illuminated chronicles of the medieval monks, and we should vainly seek their arms in the gaily coloured lists of the ancient knights. No ancestral castle of, their stand, of theirs stands like a falcon's nest above the steep shores of the Rhine or the Danube, threatening the prosperous caravans of the plain. The few indications that we have go to show that the earlier members of the family were all peaceful tradesmen. The founder of the present house was certainly born at Frankfurt on the Main, in the ghetto of which he inaugurated that struggle for life which was destined to have so brilliant an issue. It was a time when the Jewish inhabitants groaned under severe disabilities, yet the quick-witted the quick -witted and quiet-tempered Jew never abandoned his race and religion. He struggled against prejudice and toiled for the welfare of his family. He strove to raise himself above the crowd and to place the future of his house on foundations of granite. Work was his nightly motto. And for the sake of his wife and children, he worked assiduously from early morning until night, when the civic authorities fastened with heavy chains and locks the doors which confined Meyer Amschel and his co-religionists in their narrow ghetto. He bore oppression in silence. He was one of the patient, one indeed, of the most patient of the sons of Israel in the old Hansa city. The patient of nobility of the Rothschild family and their diploma of barony are hardly a century old, yet the story of this hundred years is not the mere story of a banking house. It is, if we regard it awry, aright, the history of Europe, the story of the debts and loans of its constituent states during a century. Nearly every civilized state in Europe figures in that calendar on some more or less important occasion, for some comparatively large sum of money. What state was there in the 19th century that needed money to cover its debts and did not turn to the Rothschilds? Even when it did not have direct recourse to their coffers, it sought their powerful mediation. It was by means of state loans that the house attained its unique position as a financial autocracy and cosmopolitan power. As Ludwig Born says, with his caustic humour, the balance of power in Europe is maintained by the Jews. They find money for one country today, for another tomorrow, for all of them in turns, and they thus preserve the general peace. The higher nobility of Germany and Austria-Hungary have done considerable business with the Frankfurt and Vienna branches of the firm, and we find the name of many a prince and lord of the land in the old ledgers of the offices in the Frankfurt ghetto. The following list of nobles to whom money was advanced by the Rothschilds during the sixth decade of the last century will give some idea of the extent of their operations. Prince Eisenberg Burstein, Prince Sion Wittgenstein Berleberg, Prince Wahlberg Zeal, Count Alexander Slazvanikja, Ritter von Rice, Prince Isenburg Wachtersbach, Prince Solmslick, Prince Lowenstein Wertheim, Prince Lowenstein Rosenberg, Prince Victor Eisenberg, Count Vixe, Count Zapari, Count Leningen Westerberg, Count Nixki, Count Hun Yadi, Count Shekchenyi, Count Henkel V. Donnersmark, Count Froberg, Prince Galantha Esterhazy, Baron von Griefenklau, Prince Schwarzenberg, Prince Waldberg Wolfegg, Prince Waldsee, Count Wartenberg, Prince Wide. The Rothschilds, however, never cared for loans to private individuals. If there was a question of a loan, let it be to a state, was their motto. It would be extremely difficult to calculate how much profit they made by these loans to princes and states. They were never content in those days with the mere interest on the capital they advanced. But they also engaged in very extensive speculation on change with the stock which a state issued on the strength of their operations. By this means, the firm became a financial power of the first magnitude 
and we may recognize one of the chief foundations of their success in the action of Maya Amschel when he sent his five sons to open banks in five important cities. The third son, Nathan, captured London and England, while his younger brother James ruled at Paris. The fourth son became the financial prince of Italy. The eldest of the brothers controlled the financial situation throughout Germany from his office at Frankfurt, and the second son, Solomon, lived at Vienna and was regarded as the crisis of the dual monarchy. Not sure what that means there, how to pronounce that. Crisis, crisis, crisis. If anybody knows in the comment, please uh, let me know. Within the space of a hundred years, the Rothschild family made a fortune amounting to more than 400 million pounds sterling. Amongst the many contemporaries who endeavored to penetrate the secret of this marvelous success was the distinguished diplomatist and friend of Prince Matinik, Friedrich von Jentz, who wrote as follows. The question how the Rothschild house could do all that it has done in so short a time has assuredly occupied the attention of many a businessman and politician. Possibly, however, it is not so difficult to give an answer as is generally believed. Anyone who disregards chance gains and realizes that in all large operations, success depends not only on seizing and using the fav favorable moment, but still more on a strict adhesion to certain fundamental principles, will easily see that there were two maxims in particular of which this house never lost sight, and to which, apart from its shrewd conduct of business and taking advantage of favorable opportunities, it owes a, the greater part of its actual prosperity. The first of these principles was the determination of the five brothers to conduct the whole of their business in constant cooperation. That was the dying command of their father. If they had prospered, it is because they have been absolutely faithful to this rule. After the death of the father, every offer, no matter whence it came, was discussed by them collectively. Every operation of the least importance was carried out according to an agreed plan and by their joint exertions, and they all shared equally in the profit. No matter how great the distance was between their centers, Frankfurt, Vienna, London, Paris, and Naples, it never interfered with their common understanding. In fact, it had the additional advantage that each of them could be perfectly acquainted with the situation in his own part of Europe and assist more effectively in carrying out the business undertaken by the whole house. The other principle they kept in mind was not to strain after an excessive profit in any operation, to impose definite limits on all they undertook, and, as far as human foresight and prudence could achieve it, leave nothing to chance. This maxim, Severe modum finemque tenere, be moderate and never lose sight of the goal, is one of the chief secrets of their strength. There is no doubt that with the resources at their disposal, they might have obtained a much greater advantage in one or other operation. But even supposing that it would not have affected the security of their operations, they would in the end have made less profit than they did by distributing their forces over a large number of operations which occurred repeatedly and in varied conditions. That there should be no lack of such opportunities, they were assured, not only by their wealth and credit, but by the confidence which they had inspired in all governments and large houses by the moderation of their charges, the punctuality of their deliverances, the simplicity and clearness of their plans, and the intelligent way in which they carried them out. The success which others sought in the field of commerce or of war by masterstrokes, which often led to defeat instead of victory, was attained by them through the happy application of the best principles of mercantile strategy. Not by audacity, but by prudence and perseverance. The personal or moral character of the five brothers has no slight influence on the success of their undertakings. It is not difficult to create a numerous party when one is powerful enough to enlist large numbers in one's interest. But to bring into agreement the voices of all parties and win the regard of all, one needs not only material resources, but also certain qualities of character which are not always associated with power and wealth. To do good to those about them, to refuse a helping hand to none in distress, 
to hasten to the relief of everyone who sought it, no matter to what class he belonged, and to give a pleasant form to the most material services. These ways of attaining a sincere and deserved popularity have, as thousands can testify, been followed by all the members of the family, not out of calculation, but out of their natural humanity and benevolence. They have attained one thing that few favorites of fortune attain. They have won a host of friends without making a host of enemies. It might be said, in all truth, that they have paralyzed the tongue of jealousy and malice. In such circumstances, they needed no external distinctions to adorn a position that was already so distinguished in itself. Their merits, however, have been publicly recognized by several courts. Besides various decorations which have been conferred on them, all the brothers were made commercial privy councillors of the Kingdom of Prussia in 1818 and financial councillors of the Hesse Court in 1815. His Majesty Francis of Austria gave them an hereditary title in 1815, and in 1822 he raised them to the position of Austrian barons. In addition to the brother who settled at London, was appointed Austrian Imperial Consul in 1820, and two years later Consul General, while the brother in charge of the Parisian house also was made Consul General in 1822. Thus does Gent speak of the children of the Frankfurt Ghetto, but he is mistaken in regard to the dis distinctions conferred on them. It was not in 1815 that they received the title of nobility from the Austrian government. The elder brothers Anselm and Solomon were ennobled by a decree of September the 25th, 1816, and the younger brothers Carl and James on October the 21st of the same year. It is strange to find that the third brother, Nathan, who already dominated the exchange at London, was passed over in this nomination. When there was question of giving a title to the four brothers, they tried to design a coat of arms which would reflect their financial position and great success. They thought of combining the, the arms of Hesse, England and Austria and adding a five-fingered hand as a symbol of their unity and cohesion. It was also intended to include a hound as a figure of fidelity and a stork as a symbol of piety and prosperity. However, the actual Rothschild arms, which was sanctioned by the Austrian government on March the 25th, 1817, only contains a part of these things. Six years later, not seven, as Gents says, on September 29, 1822, they were created barons, an imperial favour which was extended to Nathan also. On this occasion, they adopted a fresh coat of arms, the motto of which consists of the three Latin words, Concordia, Integritas, Industria. Concord, Integrity, Industry. The Rothschilds did not at this time owe their power to money only, as their fortune was not yet large enough to enable them to compete with and defeat bankers with a larger capital. To reach this stage, they needed the quality which we find in Nathan, who obtained an unlimited control of the exchange by colossal operations on it. In their efforts to obtain power, we find not only the three qualities which are indicated in the above motto, but a very remarkable cooperation on the part of the five brothers and a considerable faculty for grasping favorable opportunities at once and utilizing them with great energy. Further, their fortune was not due merely to the state loans which they negotiated, but to their traffic on a large scale with every kind of stock on all the exchanges of, of the Western Hemisphere. In this way, they obtained an insight into the economic and political conditions of every land, were enabled to make a shrewd calculation of the chances of war breaking out, and, according to the aspect of the political horizon, either to buy up or throw all their holdings on the market. The man who is unfamiliar with financial matters will be inclined to suppose that in their operations the Rothschilds spun a particularly complicated net of plans and needed very elaborate arrangements. He will imagine that this machinery, working in all directions and turning everything into money by means of its secret structure, could only be created by the intense speculative power of particularly gifted men like the Rothschild brothers. The facts are otherwise, however, and if we withdraw the veil from the action, not only of the Rothschilds, but the financial world generally, 
anyone can understand how much speculation on change has contributed to the accumulation of the enormous fortune of the house. An example will show this more clearly. The founders of the business negotiated with a certain state a loan of so many millions consisting of shares of a hundred florins each. The shares were handed over to them at 96 florins and they sold them at 130. This gave them a clear profit of 34%. They had at their command many means of increasing the interest of the public in the new loan and confidence in themselves. Whenever they regarded a stock as good, there was quite a struggle to secure it. Everybody wanted to invest in it so as to secure a better return on his capital. Other businessmen would have been satisfied with the above-mentioned profit which the Rothschilds secured at one stroke. They thought otherwise. They bought and sold the stock over and over again, according as they rose or fell in value. In this way, they drew enormous sums into their coffers. It is said that in order to depreciate the price of the stock, they floated a new loan shortly after the first. They had decided on this in concluding the first arrangement, but the general public had no suspicion of it. Then, when the new issue brought down the value of the preceding one, they entered the market as buyers. They bought their own stock for less than they had sold it for, and in the continual rise and fall which they controlled with masterly skill, they won an enormous profit. The five cities, London, Vienna, Paris, Frankfurt and Naples, were an excellent theatre for observing the ebb and flow of the financial tide and deploying the speculative power of the Rothschilds. Naturally, they reaped their best harvests at times of grave disturbance, especially during war. In such cases, the secret of their success was to learn the coming events before all others, and this was not a work of chance, but the outcome of their distinguished, distinguished connections and the fine organisation of their business. As they knew well that a rise, even for a few minutes, may be of the greatest importance on the exchange and lead to immense gains and losses, they were always very careful to enter into the closest possible relation to the decisive factors. They therefore succeeded in drawing into their sphere of interest distinguished politicians and men of high social standing so that they could learn important events before others. That was a very considerable aid especially at a time when the postal service was imperfect and there was no telegraph or telephone. They attached the greatest importance to receiving information from high sources and from this end they made influential acquaintances at the courts of the chief ruling families. In this, as in their willingness to make sacrifices, they showed a quite remarkable knowledge of men. We cannot regard that either as a merit or a defect. It merely sh we cannot regard that either as a merit or a defect. It merely shows the great power of adaptation that circumstances had engendered in them. The high officials whom they pressed into the service of their plans were, for the sake of their families, quite ready to turn their confidential knowledge into coin. It was quite in keeping with the moral notions of the time. If the Rothschilds had not made use of such means, their rivals would have done so. Public opinion was indifferent to such things. What people thought of them at the time may be seen in the case of gents who quietly and with the greatest complacency notes in his diary the sums that he received from the Rothschilds for such services. They were shrewd enough to know that in financial matters we have not to deal with supernatural beings, but mortals whose god is gold. They thought no sacrifice too great to attain this end. Immense sums were paid for information, but they brought a considerable interest. Secretaries of state, ministers, ambassadors, and the most intimate servants of princes vied with each other to give the Rothschilds the first news. The outbreak of the July Revolution in Paris, for, for instance, in the year 1830, was learned by Baron Nathan Rothschild before anybody else in England, and it was he who informed the English government. At Vienna, their chief informant was Baron Gentz. He never speculated on the exchange himself, but he won considerable sums 
which the Rothschilds did not grudge because he enabled them to make vastly larger sums. Baron Solomon deplores the death of Gentz in the following words in a private letter to his brother James at Paris. He was like a friend he was a friend indeed. I shall never have another like him. He has cost me large sums of money. No one would believe how much, for he merely wrote on a piece of paper what he wanted, and he had it at once. But since his disappearance I begin to see how much we have lost, and I would give three times as much if I could bring him to life again. By the organization of state loans, shrewd moves on the exchange, and their excellent supplies of information, the children of the ghetto at length attained the position of which a writer of the time said, There is only one power in Europe, and that is Rothschild. His satellites are a dozen other bankers, his soldiers are all decent merchants and workers, his sword is speculation. Rothschild is a result that was bound to come. If it were not Rothschild, it would be another. He is, however, by no means a chance result but an inevitable outcome of the state principles which have ruled Europe since 1813. Rothschild needed the state in order to become Rothschild, and the states of Europe needed a Rothschild. Now that he has become what he is, he needs the state no longer. The state needs him. A writer in the Augsburger Allgemeine Zeitung says... The remarkable position of the Rothschild family is one of the most extraordinary phenomena of our eventful age. In the 16th century, when German commerce was still in its infancy, the Fuggers succeeded in securing wealth and fame and the title of Count by the great services they rendered and loans they made to the Emperor Maximilian. The only other instance of this kind in history is that of the Rothschilds. Their contemporaries, the Barings, Hopes, Torlonias, and Aguados, have also, it is true, made colossal fortunes by their business, and even negotiated loans with many governments. But they never succeeded as the Rothschilds did in raising themselves to a higher political sphere. While the circumstances of the time were favorable to them, we must recognize that they turned them to advantage with rare ability, and so attained the remarkable position as leading financial power, which enables them to exert so powerful an influence. In the course of 28 years, the House of the Rothschilds has, in the many loans which it has made to England, Austria, France, Prussia, Russia, Naples, Denmark, Belgium, and most of the princes of the German Confederation, paid hundreds of millions to these states with remarkable promptitude and often at a time of grave political crisis and has, in this way, proved the strength of its resources. Yet all who had a share in these transactions saw their speculations always crowned with success, and the general confidence in the Rothschilds was unlimited. When in recent years the speculative spirit turned to industrial concerns and railways became a need of the continent, they again took the initiative and put themselves at the head of the movement. The Versailles Railway on the right bank of the Seine is their creation, and in Austria they gave the first impetus to undertakings of this nature by constructing the Great Northern Railway. Wherever a really national work was to be undertaken, one could rely on the cooperation of their capital. But in order to appreciate properly the higher point of view of the Rothschild House, we must distinguish several periods in its development. The first began in the year 1815 and lasted about 10 years. In this period, the foundations of their vast fortune were laid. Then came the lamentable year 1825. Excessive speculations of all kinds led to a fearful reaction in business. Hundreds of well-known businessmen got into difficulties or failed. The Rothschilds, however, were not merely uninjured. They lent the aid of their great resources and unlimited credit on all sides, and it is well known that at that time their supplies of silver and gold put the Bank of England in a position to meet its obligations. The business world already knew the wealth of the Rothschilds, but it was only during this brief and unsettled period of their career that their power was fully developed. From that time, they had a considerable 
political importance, and no government undertook any large financial operation without their assistance. In their third period, which extends to the year 1830, their repute and influence as the leading financial power continued to rise. Then the July Revolution suddenly broke out and shook European credit to its foundations, and with that begins the fourth and most brilliant stage of their financial activity. Large numbers of banking houses were destroyed by the lightning of the political storm, while the Rothschilds not only sustained the tempest, but offered the aid of their great resources to the new French government, which seemed to them a security for the maintenance of law and order. The incalculable sums which they put at the, disposable, at the disposal of the powers in that critical period and the fine diplomatic tact they displayed in the most delicate situations won for them the unreserved confidence of the various cabinets. The Rothschilds at that time did more for the maintenance of peace than the world suspected. The question naturally occurs how they found it possible to keep their position and influence in France under so many different governments. But the answer is not difficult. They belong to no political party. They are friends of the country, of law, and of peace. And as such, they could offer their great financial influence just as easily under the heterogeneous ministries of Descartes, Villel, Martignac, or Polignac, as under the government of Louis Philippe. The unquestioned power that the Rothschilds have over commerce in general is equally just in its foundation and beneficent. Their motto is peace and the development of industry, and these alone promote the welfare of nations. The age of illusions is over. Nations have long been convinced that their efforts to maintain peace do far more for their material interest than the sanguinary clash of political theories. A wealthy people is a powerful people and will not suffer any arbitrary oppression. History will quote the firm of the Rothschilds as a remarkable example of the attainment of enormous wealth and far-reaching political influence by a shrewd spirit of speculation perseverance and fraternal unity, aided by fortune and wit. The prophecy of this philosophical journalist of the Augsburger Allemagne Zeitung has been fulfilled. The career of the Rothschilds is a typical example for millions of people, and, though it is not everyone who can attain such success, these people will look back with admiration on old Meyer Amschel, and many generations will learn a lesson from his life as long as the triumph of the human mind compels attention. Indeed, apart from the romantic element in their story, the Rothschilds are entitled to great consideration from the fact that they have saved large numbers of firms from ruin. They thus became the Caesars of the world of finance. This is not a mere phrase or an exaggeration. Other bankers were, in fact, only their vassals. They might, as they willed, raise them or destroy them, but they chose to support and strengthen them as long as they did not interfere with the operations of the Rothschilds. Since the year 1840, which brought a tempest upon the economic life of the European states, the business transactions of the Rothschilds have found an additional channel. They turned to the increasing branches of industry, railways, mines, ironworks, etc., and founded banks, and thus found a means of making fresh and hitherto unexploited wealth. They retained their dominant position in the financial world as the magical power of their name was enhanced. They were now the unquestionable masters, not only of the exchange, but of trade and commerce. Numbers of prosperous banks and industries sprang up at their command, and they became owners of mines, mills, factories, and estates in every part of the world. The actual power of the Rothschilds cannot be compared with that of the five brothers in earlier days, though their fortune is larger than ever. This is due, however, not to a depreciation of ability in their descendants, but to a change of circumstances. The financial position of the various states in Europe has so immeasurably improved during the last hundred years that they no longer need an intermediary in contracting loans. Rival banks have also done their share in bringing to a close the supremacy of the Rothschilds. But if their autocracy in the money world is ended, their vast fortune remains and surpasses that of any of the American millionaires. 
neither Rockefeller, nor Carnegie, nor Astor, nor any other transatlantic prince of finance has a capital equal to that of the Rothschilds. It is estimated at more than 400 million sterling and increases daily. It would be bound to increase even if they never engaged in another transaction, as, invested at an interest of not more than 4%, their capital would yield more than £16 million yearly, or more than £45,000 a day. The mind almost reels in considering these colossal sums. Baron Albert of Vienna said was guilty of no exaggeration when he said, The house of the Rothschilds is so rich that it cannot do bad business. And this enormous fortune has been amassed by one family in the course of a single century. Century. I just said sanctuary. (laughs) Sanctuary. Sorry. Sometimes reading these things live, you get nervous and fumble your words a little bit. All right. That's chapter one, Romance of the Rothschilds. I'm just going to have a look now over here at the uh, chat just to see if we've what, what, what people are up to and what's going on and uh, see what's happening. So 13 people watching. Hi to everybody who's watching. That's really, really lovely to have you here. Oh, nice. We got some action in the chat. That's cool. Hey, we got Nigel in the house. What's up, Nigel? Yeah, I've, I have. I've got a document cam. Um, I wonder if I can spin this around. to. It's, it's, you can kind of see it here, right? This, this, this white thing popping out over. It's by Okio Labs. Um, and, I, and I was able to buy this through a general, generous donation of a viewer. Uh, and yeah, it's it's great. It's I'm really loving using it. I'm still getting used to it. I'm still not kind of smooth with it just yet. Um, Adam. Oh, nice. Yeah, Nathan Rothschild looks like he ate all the pies. Yeah, he might have some, uh, I don't know, some heartburn. Maybe that's why his face was looking, why he had a big bottom lip sticking out. Uh, you know, he, he didn't look happy. Dr. Crispy Rothschild, hello. Uh, and off topic, where did I get my glasses from? Uh, from a company called True Dark. And these these uh, really helped me um, protect my eyes from the blue light in, in screens and, and LED lights, uh, which can interfere with melatonin production and, and and bugger up your ability to get to sleep. Uh, so yeah, I really recommend, but there's loads of different brands out there now. I've had these for six or seven years or something, um, but they're, they're pretty popular these days and you can hunt around, shop around and find discount codes and whatnot. Um, but that, but I really recommend them because they're putting LED lights everywhere now, right? In the street lamps and shopping shops and it's, it's kind of strange and that incandescent soft yellow glow we used to have uh, which is much nicer. Um, that's been replaced by this bright clinical surgical white LED, and I think there's reasons for that. Um, and but it interferes with me. It, and I, and I, when I don't have these on, it makes my eyes kind of ache, and I can feel the difference. And I get like, oh, so so I got to make sure I wear these in the evening. Um, all day counts. Government bonds. King Cross. King Cross us. All he touched turned to gold. And the eyes used insider training. Yeah. Nigel, exactly. They, they must have been using insider trading, right? This, this network, it was saying here that they profited during times of war. Uh, so I imagine they would have been pulling at those levers and, and manipulating people and dropping hints and, and, and kind of stirring things up. Because if you profit from times of conflict and, and then you're going you're gonna to want more of that to happen. You know, uh, I think one thing we forget quite often when thinking about business models is that a lot of businesses, if their product or service actually worked, they'd be they'd be putting themselves out of business, <laughs> and so you've got to take you've got to question um, their motivation. You know, a classic example. Uh, I don't know. I, I like a, an example. I think of it might be like some sort sort of spot cream or something that teenagers wear. You know, acne. It's like if it worked, you'd use it once, and then your problem would be solved, and you'd never buy it again. So you, so from a business point of view, that's bad business because a customer cured is a customer lost, right? And I think that applies to a lot of uh, industry and business these days. Yeah. So the first chapter showed that they brought political influence that allowed them to. I can't see what that word is to something the markets. I'm going to guess it says rig. Yeah, Mani- rig or manipulate the markets. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, spot on. So, Romance of the Rothschilds. 
And uh, I love the quotes, really lengthy, long quotes that you picked out from other places and some of them so adoring and so gushing about this family. Um, and I'm sure that that was warranted, <laughs> but I don't know. Well, we're going to have to read on to find out. Um, that chapter also said that the brothers operated like a cartel to again rig markets. Yes. Yeah, Nigel, right on. This is great. I really, I'm really glad you're here, Nigel. Uh, this is exactly what I kind of have in mind and imagined for, for these live streams, read through a chapter and then have some conversation, some discussion in the chat and make some points and, and sort of do some analysis in real time. And so uh, I want to thank you for, for being here to take part in it. I think you, you get what I'm trying to achieve with this. And so that's really cool. Uh, yeah, rigging markets, um, you know, they're, they're making decisions as a, as a, as a group you know, all five of them. That's what it said. And, and, and it reminds me of a short video that I shared in my telegram group today, which was about the game werewolf, uh, which if you haven't played it, you get a group of people together, like a large issue group. You want, you want probably like seven, eight, nine, ten people maybe. And then, um, you have one person who runs the game and what happens is two people are werewolves and the rest of the people in the, in the group of villagers, nobody knows who's a werewolf and who's a villager. And you, you play the game in cycles and every night the werewolves will, will bump off somebody in the village. And then during the day, you all have to kind of figure out who the werewolf is and the villagers will vote someone to, to kick out of the village during the day. And this goes on with people getting eliminated through subsequent rounds until either, uh, you kick the werewolves out and you, and the villagers win or the werewolves kill everybody and the werewolves win and apparently this game was um was developed by a social sociology student to make the point that a, a minority of people who have a who have an information advantage over the majority will will always win so that that power differential that's created based on you your small group having the insider information you know and this applies to insider trading and to corruption this is how it works it's kind of that that power differential you know they say knowledge is power but that is how the the majority is kind of hoodwinked and bamboozled and ripped off over and over and over again by a small group and in this case five five brothers right so um that's that's kind of uh, just reminding me of that video there. The game's called Werewolf. If you haven't played it, it's actually a really good fun party game. Um, but only if you kind of like lying and winding people up and, and misdirecting people. And you know, I like games, uh, I like board games and, and party games. But I never, I was never good at the ones where you've got to lie and and deceive and and bluff. You know, I've never been good at those. <laughs> that's, that's not my strong suit. That's not something that comes naturally. So. Nigel, the the chapter did mention bribery or threats. You did mention or didn't mention, but I'm guessing that our family used... Oh, they, yeah. So I think you're saying that, that it didn't mention bribery or threats, but you're guessing that the family used them. Yeah, I would I would think so as well. Yeah, yeah. It, there, was, there was a bit of a hint at, in there, wasn't there? There was a hint that they used it. It was kind of... They had so much power that... Or they got to decide which uh, banks succeeded and which failed. Right. So that's, that's, that's threats right there. It's kind of like, well, he, I mean, he, the, 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 it was even written in a way that was, that was like, um, they, they didn't stop other bankings, other banks from, from surviving and succeeding, but they could have, if they wanted to, and they chose who got to have a piece of the action. And I'm sure that there had to be um, money exchanged or resources or promises or handshake agreements. And, you know, it was like, you can do what you're doing as long as it doesn't interfere with us. And it reminds me of kind of like a mafia, you know, or like this, what you watch in The Sopranos or something when another gang shows up and they start muscling in and trying to, you know, um, do some of the same shady businesses on, on, and it's like a turf war type thing. And it, and it sounds like, like the, how, how could you prevent competition from rising up and and uh, and um, competing with you, unless you're using uh, bribery and threats and and coercion and, and intimidation and these kind of sort of mafia tactics, right? <laughs> so yeah, cool. Well, that is that's. So we've been going about an hour now. Uh, thank you all for being here. I reckon we'll wrap it up there. Um, my uh, I, I have a tendency to do long live streams. I've, my last one I think I did yesterday was three hours or so. 
So I think we'll just, we'll draw it to a close and keep it a nice tidy hour. And I'll be back tomorrow night at the same time with chapter two. And oh, we got one more comment from Nigel. The chapter also suggested that the Rothschilds focused on the bond market and government debt. Yeah, that's a really good point as well. Yeah, so they weren't bothered about kind of uh, the average Joe and the average Jane, you know, taking out some money to uh, start a business or maybe uh, buy a house or something. They were they were going for the for the politicians, and then it makes you then it makes you quite wonder um, how did they how do they bribe and intimidate, threaten and coerce the politicians and the political class into uh, submission? And uh, that's a whole nother topic. But uh, yeah, let's wrap it up there. So that's that's roughly an hour. So thank you so much for being here. Um, same time tomorrow night, chapter two, we'll nip quickly back over to the handy dandy book cam and I'll show you, uh, chapter two. So this is the founder of the house chapter two. So this is going to be, I guess, more about Amschel Rothschild, the, the father of the five brothers. Uh, and what's that? 35. So that's roughly, that's going to be about 40 pages. So it was another, probably another 40, 45 minute chapter. Oh, and the other thing that might be worth just getting on the camera again is this this table of all the princes and all the all the uh, counts and all the the amounts. I didn't read the numbers, you know, the amounts that uh, he that they were loaning and giving to these people. I just read the names, and some of these names I I I, I should apologize to anybody with those names because I no doubt butchered them. But look at these numbers, and this is back back in the day, without like one hundred and four thousand. You know, 150, four, half a mil. So the biggest amount on here is Prince Galantha Esther Hazy, 533,000. So big, tidy, big sums, big sums of money involved. Uh, fascinating stuff. Very interesting. So let's wrap it up. I've said that three times and three times is a charm. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, seven o'clock, Greenwich Mean Time, UK time. Uh, tomorrow, chapter two. Hopefully see you there. Take it easy. God bless.